Welcome, Argumentation and Persuasion class. It is Wednesday, uh, October 27th, right? So, we this is our second of two YouTube lectures, and then on Friday, we are going to meet in class once again. So, you do need to show up for class on Friday, personally, okay? And also, if you uh, need any coaching, right, if you're looking at this early, I am in, in my office all day Tuesday, and I'll send you that email. You've probably already seen that email before you do this. So we're talking now about cross-examination technique. Here are some techniques to make sure that you get the most out of sex. And of course, you do know that you have some reading on the same subject in, in your textbook. So, according to your text, there are five functions of cross-examination. We're going to cover as many, of these, as many of these as we can in just 15 minutes. Okay? And so, these are different steps. You want to get to the higher levels. Don't just stick to this one. The first function is simple information gathering. This is something where you, you didn't catch a point that your opponent made, right? Uh, maybe, maybe she went a little too fast and you didn't get the little two under subpoint D. All right? So, you just ask. Okay, I didn't quite get the little two point under subpoint D. Could you repeat that for me? And so the speaker says it and you scribble it in your, on your flow, right? That's a very simple thing, but it can be helpful. You don't want to do tons of that, right? You want to keep a good flow where you're writing down your uh, arguments and your opponent's arguments in real time, right? As they're speaking, you're flowing their arguments and your own responses. But you, you can't always get everything, so it's okay to ask. Or maybe a source. Um, you got the tagline, but you were thinking, oh, I think there's a problem with the source on this one. Or I think I have some counter argument against the source. Maybe the source is biased. Uh, or maybe the, the date is really old and doesn't apply. So either way, it's okay to ask, oh, what was the source of your uh, contention one sub point B one card? Right? And they can tell you and then you can uh, make a note of that. Okay? This is a very basic element of cross-examination. It's a perfectly legitimate one, but you want to do more. If you want to do well on your debate score, on uh, debate assignment, you want to go beyond that. Second is clarification of the issues. This is a little bit deeper, but still pretty simple. This is where you're not quite sure what your opponent is getting at with a certain argument. right? Or you don't quite understand what an evidence card said, so you just ask. And so, uh, for example, if, if your opponent is arguing that, that the Constellation program was underfunded and all it needed was good funding, okay, and your opponent has evidence that says, or, or an argument that says, the Constellation program was never going to work no matter how much funding it got, okay, at least that's what you think they said. And so you say, hey, did that argument say that Constellation wasn't going to work regardless? Maybe yes, maybe no. It's okay to ask what the thrust of an argument is from your opponent. Okay? And this isn't attacking. It's just like the first function, except it's a little bit more analytical, that it isn't just a simple fact. It's interpreting the argument, interpreting your opponent's point. Because you don't want to jump to conclusions. right? You don't want to assume that your opponent is making an argument that they are not making. This happened uh, when I was in a semifinal debate in high school where my partner and I were arguing under an education topic that, that American schools should identify shy kids and should provide them with some counseling to help them overcome their shyness and that that will help them in school. All right? So we had a, um, an evidence card that referred to communication apprehension. And I'm afraid my opponent thought that we were saying comprehension. In other words, listening. And so our opponent should have asked us in cross-examination, OK, when, when you say communication apprehension, are you talking about listening there? The problem is that they didn't do that. And then we heard five minutes of argumentation from our opponent that said listening classes don't help. Listening doesn't help students improve their scores in school. It didn't apply at all. So we were able to clarify in cross-examination and in, in our speeches later that their evidence and their arguments were just missing the boat. And we had, you know, it was a very easy debate for us because they didn't just ask for that clarification. So don't go off half-cocked. Uh, make sure you know what your opponent is arguing before you refute it. Okay, third, this is getting a little bit more um, 
analytical and even argumentative when we get to the third one, which is clarifying judgment criteria. Okay? This is where you're going a little bit deeper and you're actually asking your opponent to prove that their argument is relevant. Okay? So for example, if, um, if you're on the negative side and the affirmative is making an argument about NASA, you want to make sure that argument does fulfill the resolution. Because under the resolution, the affirmative has to prove not only that our current policy is bad, but that the Constellation program is an improvement. Right? And so let's say that the affirmative makes an argument that, um, that we don't have enough funding for, for uh, manned space today. Okay? You could ask uh, your opponent, your affirmative opponent, okay, you said that we don't fund manned space enough. Did the previous administration fund manned space enough? And so basically the problem that, there, that might be is that neither President Bush nor President Obama gave enough funding. And that will make it a little bit clearer when we know what criteria we're really talking about that. Now this isn't an attack, but you're asking a probative question that is going to set up an argument later. Okay? Now further setting up arguments is this fourth level or this fourth function, building a foundation for an argument. Okay? And this is a little bit more um, jousting. Okay? Such as, did you provide evidence that said NASA's budget went up this year? Okay? Maybe they made the claim, or your opponent made the claim, but didn't have proof. So this is a, a, a way of identifying that. Because if your opponent said, well, no, I didn't uh, have that evidence uh, in my speech. Okay? And then you know that later you can say, hey, my opponent said that NASA's budget went up, but there was no proof of that. Okay? Or on the other side, uh, if you're on the negative, and you can ask, hey, was the Ares 5 rocket on schedule for launch before it was canceled? So this is a way for the negative to, ar to set up a solvency argument, to say, hey, the Ares 5 rocket really wasn't going to be ready. Okay? When we get to this fifth function, this is really good jousting here. And I hope that you can get to this level in cross X. You only have a minute, but if you don't spend a lot of time simply clarifying or just giving away your time, you want to use it, uh, you can get to this point. This is real jousting, okay? This is where you maybe uh, go a little bit more assertively and, and you kind of make an accusation against the other side. Not a personal attack, but this is where if you were on the affirmative, you could say, um, all right, does President Obama have any chance of putting a person in space before he leaves office? Right? And that's kind of an accusatory question about the status quo. Right? That's a tough question. And, and your opponent is going to try to defend that. Right? And, uh, and your opponent could say, uh, well, it may not be. We may not have anybody uh, personally in space before President Obama leaves office, but that doesn't matter. It's still the right policy because we're going to do things right. We're not going to put people at risk and we're not going to um, use technology that is outdated. We're going to do it right. And if that means that a man isn't in space until after President Obama leaves office, uh, we're satisfied with that. Okay? So that's some jousting, right? And of course you can follow up as, as the questioner there. You've got the questioner and the witness and, and you can kind of go back and forth and that's okay. The thing here is don't expect your opponent to just admit that they're wrong. Okay? They're not going to do that. Expect the opponent to put up a good struggle on that jousting point and just be calm about it. Okay? So there are lots of examples when debaters become experienced, they become really good at understanding that their opponent isn't just going to give in and that they have a good back and forth anyway. Okay? Now, what I, the note there at the bottom is one of those procedural things that we want to uh, watch out for. And so here are some really important rules. These rules are crucial. First of all, in cross-examination, as always, we need to be courteous. Make sure that no one is going to want to root against you because of your behavior in cross-ex. A lot of debaters who during their speeches are just fine, they get into cross-examination and it's like a fight or something, like an argument, and it's not really an argument. Okay? So you want to be polite. Now one element of that that I didn't put up on here that's very important is that in cross-ex, as well as the whole debate, your focus is on the audience, not the opponent. 
You don't even use second person and say, you said this. No, you know, not even in cross-examination uh, are we accusing the other side of anything. We're speaking for the audience. Now, you do use second person when you're asking a direct question. Okay? You do say something like, did you have an evidence card that said this? And that's fine. Okay? But in our speeches, we're addressing the audience. We're trying to convince the audience. So you're not even going to look right at your opponent in cross X. We're not like this and like this in cross X. Both speakers are side by side facing the audience. They might glance at each other a little bit, but you do not turn toward your opponent and you don't look right at your opponent because you know that you have an audience that you're trying to impress, not the other person. And when you're giving one of your regular speeches, you don't say, you were wrong about this. No, you would only refer to your opponent in the third person and say, um, the negative made this argument, you know, you're signposting, but this isn't right. Okay, and it's okay to refer to each other by name, but always in the third person, not the second person, because you're not trying to convince your opponent. And that's another argument for being courteous. Don't expect your opponent to agree with you. They're not going to do it. Um, but accept that and still be courteous despite that fact. Okay? A second rule, the questioner has control. I, I once saw a debate where both sides were just giving speeches during the cross-examination. They were interrupting each other. That's not how it works. If you're being cross-examined, you're the, the witness, okay, you have to defer, you have to yield to the questioner when the questioner wants to move on. Okay? Now the questioner should be polite and everything, but once the, the witness has given enough of a response, the questioner is very free to say, okay, great, let's move on to something else. And at that point the witness should, um, should yield. Okay? Now that doesn't mean that you say, Okay, this is a yes or no question. All I want is a yes or no. That's not fair because uh, usually an answer does have to be explained. Okay? But, um, but the questioner does have control. There is a, a key word here. There is a magic word uh, that the questioner uses in a, in a classroom debate when he or she wants to move on. And that is thank you. If you hear thank you and you're the witness, it means you want to wrap up or just, just stop right there. Okay? And number three, the questioner should only ask questions. I kind of alluded to that before on the courtesy matter. You always phrase everything as a question. There should always be a question mark at the end of what you say to the witness. Okay? So we wouldn't say, um, all right, in subpoint D, you said that NASA was underfunded. But NASA isn't underfunded. They just got a budget increase. Okay, if that happens, the witness is standing there going, okay. Do you have a question for me, right? So make sure that everything as a questioner you ask is in the form of a question that has a question mark. And of course, you don't want a question that takes forever. You want to be succinct with your questions. Okay? And then finally, when you are answering, you want to be uh, direct with your questioner. And it's okay to say, I don't know. Or it's okay to say, I'll have to look that up, right? But you don't want to be evasive. You don't want to say, well, what are you getting at there? I'm not sure, you know, just answer the questions and be confident. And if it is a yes or no, you know, that you can pretty much answer yes or no, it's okay to do that. You don't have to filibuster uh, as the questioner. Okay? So these are some basic guidelines for effective cross-examination. So um, this is Wednesday. On Friday, we do have a class meeting. You do want to show up to the classroom, and the topic is political debate. And so um, debate about political issues. You'll learn a lot, so be here on Friday. And thanks a lot. And thanks also, Rochelle RJ, for being our videographer. Uh, I don't have credits rolling, but if I did, her name would be very prominent. We'll, we'll talk to you soon.